Cool. Okay. Looks seems like people are the majority of maybe signed in. So we'll go ahead and get going. Um, thanks for joining everybody. And just a, a couple quick housing housekeeping things before we get going. Um, if as we're going along, uh, this really is intended to be more conversational. We have um, Greg and Jing from uh, Tygo here joining us as well as Justine from Mayfield. So I'll introduce everybody here coming up. But the the big intention here is to to be having this be conversational. So if you have questions, comments, things like that, please, uh, by all means, that's, that's why we're here. We want to turn this into um, you know, hearing from all of you. What we do ask is use the Q&A section of, the, of uh, the Zoom feature, not the chat. So if you could put all your questions in the Q&A, it just makes it a lot easier for us to, to manage those, make sure that we get those answered uh, as we're going along. So um, there's that section. And we will be, you know, this is being recorded. This will get sent out. Uh, we'll have a follow-up for you. So um, you'll be able to, to access this this recording and and the information that goes along with it. So with that, let's go ahead and get going officially. So uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Ryan Mayfield, founder CEO of Mayfield Renewables. We're a technical consultancy firm and we work with both uh, contractors and manufacturers and working on doing content strategy and production system design. And so we are um, happy to have you all here and be talking about, uh, about this new Tygo system. We're pretty excited to learn more about it. Uh, and joining us today from our team, uh, Justine Sanchez. Uh, she's our solar and storage program director. Uh, Justine's been in the industry for over 25 years uh, and been with Mayfield for uh, going on a couple years now, uh, joined in uh, early 2020. And one of the most exciting developments for Justine as of late, I would say, is uh, she's now a member of Codemaking Panel 13. So energy storage systems are part of that. And she's fresh off of a, a week of um, pretty intense code um, meetings. So um, welcome, Justine. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, um, I'm excited to be here. And uh, it was the National Electrical Code Making Panel 13. We were working on the second draft, really the uh, dealing with all the public comments that came in for the um, after the first re revision. And now we're working our way to a finalized draft for 2023. But believe it or not, that'll be out in like a year, less than a year. Um, so it's exciting times uh, to be on the code making panel. I'm psyched to be there. And it's like to be here talking energy storage with some old friends and new friends, and uh, it should be a good, fun discussion. Great, yeah, um, lots of fun stuff. I'm, I'm glad that you're out there, um, you know, looking in that crystal ball. So in a year, when codes out there, we, we're all covered. We got everything, all of the new stuff <laughs> covered under that. Um, also joining us today is Jing Tian, uh, Chief Growth Officer, Officer from Tygo Energy. Uh, Jing has been in the industry for over 15 years. Um, she has been working on many uh, different parts of the industry, uh, former president of Trina Solar USA and general manager of Shift Energy USA. And she brings her knowledge from manufacturing on modules, um, inverter production development, and solar project uh, financing and, and development. So um, Jing, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Really appreciate the opportunity. I'm looking forward to have a conversation and really uh, get a chance to introduce uh, Tiger's product. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And then we also have Greg Smith joining us. Um, and the bio that I have to read is that everybody knows Greg. So I think we can just move on from there, apparently. Um, <laughs> Greg has been in the industry, I don't know how long, a um, couple years now, and um, has a book, The Solar Solar Battery Home. Did I get that title right, Greg? Close enough. Battery okay. Powered Home. Battery Powered Home, excuse me. Battery Powered Home um, is a book that Greg wrote um, fairly recently and has joined uh, on Otago recently as well. And so um, really excited to have your input. You know, Greg's been doing uh, training, uh, working with folks in the industry for a long time. So 
a lot of knowledge there and be able to, to talk about the system and just kind of what some of the features and benefits. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I appreciate it. Always good to talk to you guys. Yeah, likewise. Okay. Well, we're going to jump into this. And, you know, one of the, the big things, you know, the reasons why we're here talking with Tygo is, of course, you know, energy storage systems are um, proliferating. I guess, you know, it's, um, there's so many systems out there now. And, you know, all, we have so many different use cases uh, and, and ways that we're integrating solar plus storage into our systems now. And so with this new system uh, that, um, that, that Tygo has been bringing out, I uh, just wanted to get an opportunity to kind of get an idea of, you know, the, the system as a whole and, and understand it better. So with that, um, I'll let uh, Jing and Greg kind of do the introduction on the system itself and, and we can kind of take it from there. Yep, thanks Ryan. So I'm going to start it um, with the Taigo Energy Intelligence Solution. It's really built on the Taigo's knowledge with the TS4 flexible module level power electronics. The entire system composed of uh, inverters. It's a hybrid inverter DC coupled uh, with the EI battery and the ATS. And on top of that, everything is uh, communicated, controlled, and monitored by our energy intelligence platforms. Um, so the system, what we trying to do is to have all the integration with all in one, we have all the solutions from Tygo, but you still give you maximum flexibility. You have a choice of a different TS4s. Um, battery, I will go into a little more details. Batteries are also modular, so give it lots of flexibility on the system design. So next page. So some of the key features, um, it's a fast install. Um, so we, uh, our TS4 is only take about 10 seconds to really uh, install it on the um, modules. So most of you are quite familiar with it. And the entire system is a scan, uh, be able to uh, commission in 10 minutes. We have one of the key feature we introduce is the bulk scanning process. And the, as some of you are familiar with Tygo TS4, uh, you need the scan for each um, TS4 AO um, for the system layout monitoring. So we have the new feature introduced uh, for, we can scan over 30 modules at once. So that really speed up the commissioning process. Next one. And the system is very flexible, it's scalable. So we use the TS4 AO or TS4 AF, depends on what you need. And also the battery is modular. So it's again, go anywhere from 3.3 uh, kilowatt hour, each modular up to 20 um, kilowatt hour. So that is the really give you flexibility on your system design. Next one. So um, Tiger is being industry leaders. So, so we have a longest warranty in the business. So, um, we provide up to 12.8 months of inverter uh, warranties and with battery up to 11 years. So uh, we have uh, you know, our very ex um, localized uh, customer, uh, customer satisfaction teams. So we, uh, all, you know, all the people will be local to support you for your know, installation. And then we have a site specific um, um, apps and also you know, designs to support for you. So, okay, so I'll go into a little bit details on the components. So um, as you see here, this is one enclosure of a Tiger EI battery. So inside it is a um, BMS and there's three battery modules. So each of these components comes with a 10 kilowatt hour and but you can expand all the way up to 40 um, kilowatt hours. In other words, four enclosures. And they can be uh, paired for essential home backup or whole home backup. And then you can also um, uh, have a very, uh, three different mo um, modules to control the battery for time of use, uh, self-consumption, as well as for backup mode. Let's take a look at the ATS next. 
Um, with ATS, we have two options. So it's a 50 amp and then 200 amp. A 200 amp is coming. 50 amp is shipping right now. And 200 amp should be available towards the end of this year. And both the products are outdoor rated. Um, so it can support the essential load or home load with the 11, 11 years of uh, warranty. That's good. Next one. Um, on top of that is uh, the whole entire system will have an energy um, intelligence platform. So this one, uh, it's one software um, does everything. So it can do the commissioning on the app and can do the monitoring as well as the system control. And uh, this module shows it's on the website, uh, web, a web view with the fleet management. It can, it's configurable with the look of the fleet management. And they, you can also configure the alerts with the system, depends on your needs. It's really to empower our installers to have an entire view of the system and, um, and be able to reduce your um, in the OAM cost. Great. So, so Jean, I, I really appreciate that that overview on on the um, all the different components. Um, I guess one of the questions that I had immediately is, you know, I'm just thinking about, you know, Tygo uh, obviously is doing module level power electronics as a uh, primary. Uh, business line or pri primary product, um, I guess, can you just speak to, to Tygo jumping into the ESS? It seems like a, a huge uh, change, I guess, and just kind of what that, uh, kind of how that decision, where that came from, and just kind of what it is that, that Tygo's um, looking to, to serve the market with. Yeah, I mean, I think the key is we really listen to the market. We got a lot of, uh, as you mentioned, Ryan, there's a growing market um, you know, in the storage. There's more uh, people looking for more solutions. And Tiger have heard a lots of customers asking, you know, we're doing module level um, um, optimization and matching with the inverters. Now say, why don't you just have an entire solution for us? It will make our life easier, <laughs> right? So um, that's a lot of, we heard it from customer. I would believe that you know, the market needs more suppliers um, to meet the 40% year over year um, growth in the residential market segment. Uh, storage, um, it plays a significant role. Um, we think it, there's a need in the market um, that's where we are leveraging our know-hows and to provide additional features to the market, uh, products to the market. Yeah. Cool. I'm curious too on, on the system as a whole. So we looked at the, the battery and the ATS, for example. And so how is this a, um, a system that can be integrated into existing PV systems or, or how is that, what's the, um, what are, what are the limitations or, or what how are you um, looking to get this integrated into to new or existing installations? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, our design product planning is one system for uh, goes back to our ideas being flexible. So the system designed for both uh, new system or typically people call it DC couples. And then also we can do the AC couple, but that feature is in development. We expecting to introduce to the market um, in January, oh no, actually Q1 next year. So okay. we should, the same system should be able to do both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess I have a follow-up to that. So if you had existing Tago units in your installation. Um, could, you, could you utilize those and just add on, on the battery, the hybrid inverter, and maybe take out your old inverter if you wanted to? Uh, yeah, yeah, that should be, that's compatible, yes. Okay. And then I, well, I've got all kinds of technical questions. If we're, if so we're Greg has got other, uh, no, to add in. Yeah. I, like, you will be able to use it because, I mean, I still have some TS4 is here ready to go, right? So mm -hmm. as soon as uh, I get my Tygo system, I'm going to be having all kinds of fun. So yeah, I'm going to swap out the TS4 Fs that I have up on the roof right now. So I've got a 5,100 watt array mm -hmm. and I've got a 5,000 watt Sunny Boy. And so as soon as I get the Tygo solution, 
uh, to say goodbye to my sunny boy, but I'm going to uh, swap out the inverters and the batteries with the Tygo stuff and, and then swap out the TS4s that are up there with these uh, TS4Os, which do optimization and monitoring and rapid shutdown. So cool. all, all good. <laughs> yeah, the evolution continues at Greg's house. <laughs> I know. Hey, I'll take whatever they give me. <laughs> so some of my other, uh, speaking of evolution at, at, at locations, so I happen to be in one of those oddball locations at 9,000 feet uh, in, in a cold climate. And so I've noticed, you know, looking at the energy storage gear as I have been, a lot of them have elevation limitations about where they can be operated. Can you guys speak to what your, your um, limitation is there? Yeah, I mean, I think I can do a quick conversion. I think Greg did the conversion for me is 3,000 meter. We can operate up to 3,000 meters. So I think that's over 9,800 feet um, elevation. And then we can operate at uh, minus 13 Fahrenheit, um, uh, you know, to 40, 45 Fahrenheit. Yeah. From 45 degrees C. I'm confused with the Celsius and the Fahrenheit. This is like a really dumb. We always have to convert in temperature. So I know. <laughs> 113, 113 Fahrenheit. Yeah, 113 Fahrenheit. Yeah. 113. And you said, I so I would thought you guys went down to 14 F. Um, is that true? Or does it go even lower than that for, for operation? I think that's the temperature, 14F. Okay. Yes. 14 yeah. F. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's helpful for, for myself. I, I've noticed uh, some of the energy storage units out there really are, um, they're telling you, you know, at uh, 6,000 feet, you know, mm -hmm. don't, don't install this higher. So that is helpful for me to have that higher uh, elevation setting for sure. Yeah, you can have our battery storage system over there. So. Okay, good. You can send me one Seems right like over. That. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and for most of the, the systems out there, what I've seen, the, the manufacturers, it, it's either 2,000 or 3,000 meters. Like that's mm -hmm. it. Yep. And then I guess the uh, other question I would have, so is so that with the ATS, you, uh, currently your solution, or the one that's available now is the 50 amp option. So that would say to me, that would be for a system that's not doing whole home backup. You've got a basically a uh, specific backup loads panel that you would be operating off the ATS, not trying to do your whole house, but moving forward, you guys have a 200 amp solution coming up? Yes, yes, we are we almost done. We're in the process of the get final certification. So mm -hmm. I will estimate uh, start coming out in December this year. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that whole home, I talk about that in my book a lot and I have been harping on it for many, many years. Like whole home backup, people like to do it because they don't have to migrate circuits, right? Mm -hmm. They don't have to install a sub panel, uh, but it's a, in, in my opinion, it's a much riskier install. Unless you have something like a span panel or a smart load center, you're relying on the homeowner to turn things off, right? Oh no, I'm only gonna run my laptop and you know a couple lights, you know, just that's all I'm gonna do. Yeah, right. So they they will usually run things longer than what they put on their load sheet, and they'll usually run more things than they said they were going to run. So I'm a big fan of just busting out, you know, six circuits, pick six, right. And having an essential load panel. But again, we're not going to tell people what to do. We do have the 200 amp coming out for the whole home. So our, our sales engineering team, I am training them really well on how to talk to people about that. <laughs> so that leads me to a follow-up question, and I don't know if you guys can speak to this or not, but load management, would that be a part of your planning forward with equipment that's integrated already um, into Tygo, or is that something you can't speak about yet? <laughs> Oh, no, I think it's on the roadmap. I mean, I think, you know, we really look at a home automation, uh, autonomous home uh, over time. I mean, this is, a, you know, home, uh, smart home load management. I think that's very much is on our roadmap. But we do want to focus on get the basic system uh, do it right at the first place, so rather than trying to adding lots of features, right? So um, that should be coming, you know, in the near future. So, yeah. Yeah, that's great to, to hear. I mean, I guess one code thing I would say, uh, moving into 2023, like right now, um, we can design systems to just have enough, enough capacity um, to just cover the largest single load. But moving forward into 2020, that's going away. 
Um, yeah. And we're going to have to go by the 702 rules, which tells us we have to either have load management right. or enough capacity to, to carry the full load. So I'm glad to hear that that's on the roadmap because it's going to be a, an issue um, code-wise coming up. Yep. Yeah, yep. it's like they... I, and that that's comes from the generator side of things, right? Like they're like, yeah. oh, well, we want battery and all that to act like a generator. It's like, come on, man, like give us a break. But yeah, whatever. Well, there's always a, there's always a way around that, but we'll we'll get it. Um, and just I, I'm looking here in the chat, or I'm sorry, the Q and A. Yeah. And James has a really good question. Uh, Jing, I think you'll you'll really like to speak to. Sure. Uh, um, yeah, talking. it's about the talking about an um, uh, integration for the EV charging and vehicle. Exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, it, again, the, just as mentioned earlier, asking, it's a great segue to Justine's question. I think it's on the roadmap. I mean, I think it, what we need to do is, uh, as I said, we've got to get our inverter battery system to work well. And the our 200 amp ATS that is built with the room for expansion for adding generator, adding EV charges. Uh, you know, there's a lot of development in this area. So we definitely, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, we'll be working on it in our future roadmap. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like there's a lot of good questions. Anyone else on here? Uh, any others that we wanna? Yeah, I was gonna actually go backwards a little bit. Um, okay. The, uh, the busy guys were just talking about it and I'm hopefully I was following along. Um, and Greg said he was going to talk about code all the all day long. So I'll bring up the code question here. Um, but so uh, Russell did ask the question about sizing backup power based on total load versus largest load, if ever. And the reference is 710.12a. Uh, and so I guess, Justine, you may have some input on that. And Greg, I know that you probably do as well, just having you know been, been around that and, and how to size the system properly. And, and Justine, you would mentioned something about maybe 23 looking down the road. Yeah, so so he, I don't know if that's so much a question as a comment. Um, he's right right now, oh. um, and it's going to get harder. Uh, right now, this is actually the easy thing. Um, power must be equal to or greater than the largest load. And so you got to look in your panel. And because we're allowed to go by 710 rules, if we're operating an energy storage system in backup mode or island mode, um, according to the code, we can go by 710. And um, as long as our inverter capacity, watts, kilowatts is, uh, or amps, I should say, is uh, large enough, can supply that single largest load, we're okay by code. Moving forward to 2023, um, they're gonna be shut, that, that ability to, that language about in island mode is going away. So 710 is just gonna be about standalone systems. And um, we're gonna be forced over into 702, which changes that to being, um, we have to actually have load management or sizing our capacity to, for the full load of the, of the panel really. And so that's, that's where we're headed, but we're not there. And a lot of places won't be there for, for many, many years. Um, that almost sounds, I mean, I, I remember having challenges with AHJs way back when on standalone systems. And there was something in 690 back when battery stuff was in 690 uh, talking about how you didn't have to do that essentially. So maybe it was the 710 where we got, we were being getting away with it for years or something. So that seems like a, that could be a huge challenge coming up. Yeah, it's, it's one that, you know, it's a head shaker, Justine. Maybe you can smack some sense into them because it's just like it, it makes this asinine assumption that when the grid goes down, everybody, their first instinct is to run around and start turning all their loads on. Right. And so I don't know, it, it will make it harder on us, I think, uh, if that does go through. But, you know, there's always a way around it. It's just going to take a little more planning and it may force people. Uh, as I said earlier, to bust out those essential load panels, which is not a bad thing. Right, exactly. I mean, they do make sense so we don't overtax our batteries. Um, we use a lot more power than, than we think we yeah. do. So it's, it's the way we've always done it. So it, it does make sense. But with load management coming on, I mean, I think there's a lot of new tech solutions coming, coming along here. Yeah, indeed. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Um, so another question specific to, and this was Russell asked this one as well. Um, so when used with the TS4AO, does it change the algorithm during the period of peak generation given the ability, ability to capture excess DC current? 
to charge the battery versus clipping. So I guess that's a, for the new system, are you able to, instead of seeing the, your system going to clipping, are you able to capture that? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Because the TS4AO, um, I mean, the short answer is no, it doesn't change the algorithm at all. Um, but, you know, just going, expanding a little bit on that, a TS4AO is a, a module level optimization. It's really to, you know, if you have a shading, if you have a mismatch in the strings, allow you to um, maximize the production of the system. And if you actually look into our Tiger monitoring platform, we also captured the information on the reclaimed energy. Say if the energy would have lost without a TS4 AO and show you the amount of energy gain with the TS4 AO. Um, in terms of access, uh, you know, DC current, um, you know, access energy production during the during the day with the battery, that is the battery operation mode, then we can use the access, you know, control from inverter and battery to have access energy charge the battery. So that's, you know, time of use or consumption, self-consumption mode. Great. Um, so Robert um, put in the, the chat, he was asking about, um, having Jing just discuss the opportunities around uh, contractors using fleet management to grow service and maintenance business lines. So I guess with this, you know, we have on the screen here, so the energy and intelligence platform, uh, is that something that, you know, the, the contractors could be using for both their PV systems and their, their storage systems to help kind of that, that whole service line of business? Yeah, no, I think it's great. I would uh, welcome Robert to take a look at our you know, uh, platforms. I think uh, right, um, Lucas can probably post the links here. Um, what does is actually depends on the system you install, right? So it can give you all the way the module level visibility of each system performance. And then also can give you, if you don't have the TS4 AO installer, but does give you entire system view and the, give you entire free view of the system performance. In there, you can set up the alerts, uh, how you want to be uh, notified, and they also give you additional system performance comparison. Depends on level of monitoring uh, subscription you get. If you get a premium, we have the entire lifetime of the system performance. So allow you really give you all the data um, uh, analytics to be able to look at the history of the system performance in a lot of ways can help you remote diagnosis the system. So, because the, your most cost is a truck roll. So if you can reduce your truck roll, or you actually know what the problem you're gonna deal with before you send the truck out, that saves you a lot of the time and the you know service operation costs. Yeah. Right, exactly. And so, I'm sorry, you may have said this. So what about the, the energy storage system? How much insight, I guess, do you have on that um, in terms of being able to give your customers, you know, remotely give them some intelligent information on what is or uh, you know, what's going on with that system. Yeah, so we have the equally have all the uh, information on the energy management system, uh, or, you know, the battery systems. Uh, I think it, ultimately we will provide the, uh, the current voltage temperature performance of the battery for the installer. So they should have visibility to all okay. the battery performance. Yeah. It'll be the same stuff that, that everybody is used to seeing, right? Like we're not going to give you guys access to you know cell voltages right we're not going to get that granular but we'll give you guys uh the the pertinent information to help you remotely troubleshoot and you know kind of fine tune and tweak the system because you know there we find out that you know like people want to put their system in time of use mode right because they just have that that one window they want to offset right just like me so from five to eight here in smud territory central california I had it set to five to eight, but I realized that once you start managing your consumption, you can start opening that window up, right? And so you can start tweaking and playing around with your system to give you more than just what, you know, the utility company is going to ding you for in that three or four hour window, right? So we give you the ability to remotely get in there and do that. In the fleet view, uh, we, we have these intelligent alerts. We totally revamped this. And you guys know where I come from and module level stuff is still kind of new to me, but I am digging it. And I tell you, and I'm, I'm a big enough man to realize and to admit that I was wrong for a lot of this. 
right? And I don't understand why you would put something up on the roof like th that would not give you that visibility. Like I totally get why you would want to put a TS4F up there. You want to comply with rapid shutdown, but you don't get any of this cool stuff that you're looking at on the screen. You don't get any of that visibility. And the average truck roll in the United States is $400. So the guys that are penny pinching and instead of installing an O, they install an F. So they're saving, I don't know, 15, 20 bucks a unit. The first time you roll a truck roll to go look for something because the F doesn't have this visibility, you just burned up that 400 bucks. Or you just burned up the savings that you had by getting this module level monitoring. Like, I don't, I don't understand why you wouldn't want to do that, right? Because you get so much more visibility. And the, the, the monitoring platform for the battery includes all of that. You get all of that visibility. I dig it. That's cool. So Greg, I'll throw you guys a bone here. Uh, you know, I had one of the first or a beta units uh, over in an old house of mine. Tygo came out, installed them. And lo and behold, <laughs> I had th out of 10 modules, it's a smaller system. I had three modules that were just, you know, you see the screen, you see bright green, bright green, dark, like evergreen, dark, bright green, dark, ever. Like, so the coloring is what the power is and so I'll immediately like with one shot i was like oh my gosh i have three modules that are like producing a fraction of what the my strong modules are producing and i would have never known that if i didn't have that like side by side comparison and of course i got you know this is way back in the day i got the modules there was a good deal it's a reason there was a good deal but i had no yeah. idea why and but i could have gone along you know for the lifetime of the system having no idea and just because all you have to go by really is your bill and depending you know i had, to, I had one kid then i had another kid so our bills were going up anyway um mm -hmm. and so it was really crucial to for me to, to go through that to, to even realize i had problems with my modules and then i went and i got them replaced and but i would have never known that if without that monitoring it, it is so yeah, that's cool. a great example it's so yeah. cool and i i've seen like uh the system be able to tell you if there's a bad bypass diode, like that blew me away. I'm like, how can you know that? You can. And yeah. all the, oh man, modules never go bad. <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. It's so cool. That um, that system that we showed in a lot of our presentations is a floating array, which I never even heard of till I started working with Tygo. And there's a lot of them that are like in the ocean, in these big areas. And I've seen them over time you see the power start to degrade because of all the bird poop that gets on those modules from the pelicans and the seagulls and all that stuff. It's, it's so cool. So we have any more questions? I got to keep look on the board here. Yeah, no, there's, um, so there's a question. It's definitely not a um, Tygo specific question, but it's, you know, asking about reliable tool to model large PVN energy storage systems for self-consumption. And I guess that I get, I will throw that over to, to Jing and Greg. Uh, just curious if you guys are, if you, Tygo, are doing any of that or, you know, working with your customers on the modeling side, you know, I, we can speak to it a little bit ourselves as well. And actually, I'm going to go back to just kind of showing this prettier picture here so we can reference some of these, um, some of these components as we're talking about them. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think uh, I can probably just... Uh... Uh, talk briefly. I mean, we do have a, a system sizing um, for string sizing, uh, as well as a, a you know estimate on the battery size. But we, you know, it's pretty preliminary. I think uh, you know there's obviously lots of uh, tools out there. Um, Ryan, you probably know a little more about it. But we we are working on that to you know providing a Tiger specific uh, to really um, design tools to make a customer's life easier. Yeah. yeah, the and I think what what the question was getting at is like, do you have something like PV Syst or Helioscope, right? Something yeah. that will be able to model um, the energy storage systems along with solar. So there's a lot of great tools out there that can model solar. The those tools have a little catching up to do yeah. when it comes with adding energy storage systems to have a, a good predictive model. I know I talked to Paul Grana every once in a while from Helioscope, and I know that they are, are working to, to be able to get something done like that. Something that's as accurate with the batteries as it is, you know, already with just the solar stuff. So I don't know, um, Justine, Ryan, maybe you guys know of something. Well, we is, I mean, in, in most of our systems, especially when we're looking at um, for resiliency, 
projects, we're using Homer Grid, and there's it's it's a very complicated tool, and <laughs> it takes a yeah. bit of, of working with, but it does allow us to look into those um, the the money savings, the uh, if you're using a generator in the system, the fuel savings, and um, there's a lot of different layers to that program. So that might be something. Although it doesn't, I mean, that, they were asking about large scale. I don't see you guys going after the large scale market currently. This is home scale oh. stuff. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, catch. that's a good yeah. point. Yeah, that's yeah. very good point. Well, yeah, and I would throw out there too. Energy tool base is a is a good tool um, on the modeling side, especially yes. on um, some. Well, you can use it on on the larger scale for sure, and um, the the resilience aspect uh, and using multiple um, power sources is uh, the tricky part there. And so I, I would say that the two that we've seen the most are energy tool base and, and Homer, uh, yeah. as, as kind of those modeling type programs for that. And Homer is good. I mean, it, it is as detailed as like that SMA sunny design when you start doing like off grid village electrification projects, Yeah. but man, you need to take their little training classes. Otherwise you won't, you won't know how to do any of it, yeah. but it's awesome. Once you learn how to do it, it'll pump them out. So, yeah. Absolutely. It's like, that, I like that top question too about, I mean, are there any plans for three phase uh, development or are we sticking with the home, home, home scale? Uh, the, you know, Tiger's been very, have a pretty good, very successful in the CNI business. So, I mean, we're clearly going to continue to evaluate in the market and see if there's a need um, and, uh, you know, for us to really have an additional product to support that market segment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's where the money is, right? So it just, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it lends to, yeah, that's where we're going to go, you know, eventually, right? Uh, there's a good one here, um, the minimum ambient temperature for exterior battery install. So the battery is NEMA 4, as well as the inverter, as well as the ATS. So even with the most antagonistic, strictest, you know, AHJ out there on, on where you can place these things, outside is, for now, against a structure is still okay, right? So we go from minus 14 to plus 13. Mm -hmm. Plus 113. Yeah, what did I say? Well, are you talking C or F now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I always try to use F. Okay. Okay. So yeah, 14 to 113. Yeah, maybe I should learn to stick. I keep switching C and F. That gets me very confused. So I, I yeah. wish we would go. Or the United States could just join the rest of the world. And I agree. I agree. <laughs> Seriously, man, like what let's get the, with it. I like the inches and the centimeters. Yeah. Um, I see next question about a sun spec open source. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Let's I think. It, oh, go let's, ahead. Let's, let's read the question. Um, uh, we just got reminded that the participants can't see the question, and so it's helpful okay. to read them out loud. Um, I'll read this, and then you can answer it. Sure. Uh, from, from James, it says, "I believe the Tygo used the sun spec open source." open source communication protocol for rapid shutdown communications and control, which allows compatibility with other manufacturers equipment. Do you plan to continue to use open source protocols and work with other vendors on compa ca compatibility issues? Um, yes, I mean, the answer is yes. I mean, I think that is our, you know, basis of our business philosophy. I mean, we want to be uh, flexible and be compatible with all the suppliers. Um, today, I actually don't have a number off my head. Sarah knows everything. We have literally hundreds of inverters compatible today. We continue to do that. If anyone got new inverters, like to talk to us about the compatibility, we conduct all those testings um, for TS4AO as well as with TS4AF, uh, that it will be continued. Um, to supporting that. So. I, I guess, yeah, oh, go ahead. I, I was just along those same lines. It just, that question made me start thinking about um, just rapid shutdown in general. Of course, everybody's favorite topic, I know. Um, <laughs> but I guess, can you speak to the rapid shutdown, like the initiation? Like, so now we have, you know, we're, we're not doing just a grid tie inverter where loss of AC can be the initiator here. Uh, loss of AC for this type of system is what this was built for. This was, you know, to to do that. So can you speak to, you know, what does that initiation look like? Do, do the installers have to do something separate? Is there a different switch? How, how do you guys handle that? 
Yeah, we need to install a different switch. Um, it's the, the well, I, I jokingly call it a mushroom button, right? So you put in that uh, in the circuits, so which uh, you initiated that because uh, um, depends on in which circuit, if it's on the grid mode or if it's in the backup mode, the inverter will respond to either way and they initiate the rapid shutdown. And we provide that. Uh, in that the switch. package, it's, yes. It's yeah, it's that red push button. Sure. You know, we, we call it chicken switches, but yeah, we, we give you that. You just have to run two wires into the inverter. We give you the, the little Phoenix mail adapter, plug it in and good to go. Okay. So it's just a, so it's a, it's a contactor that tells the, um, tells the inverter, Hey, I'm actually in a mode that we need to be turned off. Not actually. That's right. Yeah. Sending power. Okay. Nice. I had another code question earlier. Um, you know, but DC or sorry, the ESS disconnect that's part of 706 that um, you know really points to. I mean, there's, there could be a couple of solutions, and I was looking at your gear to see if there was a way because there are some existing DC disconnects. It looks like on like one's on the battery unit itself, and it looks like there's one on potentially the inverter. But um, it's what what do you recommend for that external? You know, it has to be outside the home for one and two family dwellings, lockable. Um, and so Greg, what would you recommend? How would someone deal with that compliance? Yeah. So we do not have a, if you look, well, I don't know if you can see it there, but on the left side, there's a little compartment that opens up with two uh, Phillips screws, right? So you just open it up and then that's where the battery on off switch is. Well, that's not lockable. It's, you know, it, it doesn't comply, right? So you will have to put a separate DC disconnect between the battery and the inverter. And then that will go wherever code compliant, whatever your AHJ, I mean, I don't know how, there's thousands, right? I'm, maybe even 10,000 AHJs, so I can't keep them all straight, but um, the code is pretty clear on that. So we will always recommend, and our sales engineers will recommend putting a, a lockable blade disconnect between the inverter and the uh, battery. Okay, that's helpful. Clear cut. Good like, deal. Yeah. What else you guys want to talk about? So I was actually <laughs> curious, and, and this may have been said, and um, you know, trying to do multiple things at once. Uh, so somebody else probably missed it. So what is the the power rating of the inverter? I, I missed that entirely. Oh, uh, the we have two versions of the inverter. It's a seven point six kilowatt and eleven point four kilowatt to, oh, okay. to power rating. Yeah. Okay. Two pole forty, two pole sixty. Easy peasy. And you and, would, you can stack up to four. Is it four of the units? Uh, I'm sorry, of the batteries, or is it 40 kW kilowatt hours? Yeah, so it's a 40. So let me just walk through the steps. So each battery enclosure, you can have a three battery modules. So for people, 10. yes. So for, if people ordering 10 kilowatt hour, mm -hmm. it comes in four boxes. Like one box is the uh, enclosure. Then you have a three battery modules and that adds up a total to 10 kilowatt hour. I mean, truthfully, is 9.9 .9, um, kilowatt hour. Um, you know, we just uh, made a decimal to 10. And then all those are, are pre-wired and the installation is super simple. All you do is just to click, put it, uh, the mechanical, uh, what do you call it, the screw to put it on, then with the plus minus and the communication cable, that's it. Uh, is super easy. And so that makes a 10 kilowatt hour. So for our system, you can do um, primary and the expander. So you have an expander box, then make it into 20 kilowatt hour. And then the in December, we're gonna have the upgrade with our 200 amp ATS. Then allow you to do is a two and a two side by side. In other words, parallel that make it into a 40. So actually the total backup of power will be high at that point, it can go up to 10 kilowatt hour backup of power. Right now it's a five kilowatt uh, backup of power. So. Okay. Yeah, pretty slick. Good stuff coming. Yeah. And it is no joke. I put this thing together in the Campbell office and it is the easiest battery bank I have ever connected. The wires are labeled exactly on the terminals. 
where they go on the batteries on both ends. It's, oh man, it's super cool. Like I wish everybody would be this easy. <laughs> So we have and also our inclusion is IP56 um, uh, rated, so it's auto rated, so the system can go outside. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great feature. Yeah. Um, there's another question here from Russell. Is there a relay built into the battery to allow for a low voltage switch um, versus a DC disconnect? Mm. Greg, no. do you know that one? Yeah, no, there, there isn't anything on the boards, but I, I'm writing all of these down because that is a great feature upgrade yeah. and there's I, I can think of two applications of why he's asking that so no, right now no we we do not have that ability yeah it seems like that be, could be something i mean you have the rapid set, shutdown initiator so it's kind of a, along the same lines as a, it seems like something that's you know i guess yeah. similar and you, you already have that application so just a, a different um different thing to shut down Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, and this, there's plenty of room on that battery circuit board when you open that door. There's plenty of room for something like that. That's for sure. And when did you say that the uh, was for your AC coupling possibility? Was that a, do you have a timeline set for that? Yeah, we're looking at the probably end of the Q1 um, to, to get into the market. It's really, we need to do a little bit of hardware upgrade and some software upgrade. Um, so it's just the timing. And do you, I mean, I guess, do you foresee any particular manufacturers that you immediately would be compatible with? Or um, I know you guys have worked a lot with other manufacturers with your rapid shutdown gear, it would seem. Uh, in, in principle, should be uh, compatible with all the inverters as long as you know, can respond to great forming uh, information, right? Because right. our inverter needs to do great forming, they can respond to our frequency, then it should be, should be able to be compatible. So. I mean, and that's the beauty of, of AC coupling, right? It doesn't matter what existing inverter is installed. You just put the, the AC coupled compatible ESS and it'll work, right? So as long as, you know, as long as that existing inverter operates within the UL 1741, you know, 59.3 to 60.5 Hertz, then we would be able to turn that thing off when the grid is down, if the batteries are full and there's excess solar. Yeah. So, but on the flip side, well, this is what I've run into. Not all grid tight inverters um, can or like the synthetic grid produced by a battery based inverter. So we've had to actually swap some, some units. I won't call anyone out uh, right now, but that's something that we've run into. Just their tolerances are just too tight and don't like the synthetic grid. Um, the yeah. Grid, and, yep. To Sorry, keep it off but... operating, you could shut it down, yeah. no problem. But it's just going to stay shut down. Right. I mean, I yeah. think it's a good point. I would we'll probably should look into a little bit more details on the compatibility. Yeah. yeah. And th and that would definitely be a conversation you have to have with the inverter manufacturer, right? Because mm -hmm. I mean, we we don't do anything but make just like every any other battery system, right? We just make a grid, and yeah, some some inverters, and and I know exactly who you're talking about. Get a little get a little touchy with it, so. Yeah, that's definitely a conversation to have pre-sale. And yeah, yeah, I get it. <laughs> Is there any plan or thought of having, you know, Tago working with some of the manufacturers so there's some direct communication there? Or is that just a, a non-starter with, with the other guys? You know, and I, I've run into this with the two previous companies that I've worked for, right? And mm -hmm. it's it's difficult to do that. Right. Okay. It's difficult yeah, I mean, because you've got two different protocols, right? There's two different types of, of communication or more, and they have their own way of doing it. And it's like, well, we don't want to have to modify our parameters, our algorithms, our hardware, our software to work with just this one person. Sure. Right. And I, and I'm wondering if there's just a little bit, you know, these inverters that, that don't work with anybody else's, you know, uh, a battery system, but they'll work, you know, they, that particular manufacturer also makes a battery. And I'm wondering if like, well, okay, you know, they're kind of driving people toward using their battery solution in, in, in their uh, architecture, instead of like having 
a, a, an AC coupled with a third party inverter. You know, I don't know, but that's always my conspiracy theory uh, <laughs> tinfoil hat on there, but. Gotcha. Got a couple more questions. Which one, Ryan? Uh, um, yeah, we can ask, I mean, Lotus was asking, and this goes back to the, the disconnect questions. Um, you know, is it possible to have, the question is rather than two separate disconnects, why not provide an AC disconnect that shuts off both the main AC and the DC wiring of the batteries? Is that a possibility? Lotus, man, good to see you. And I figured I'd get a question like this from you. <laughs> I am not aware of a disconnect that's both AC and DC rated that would have the terminals to be able to do that. Sounds like a good idea, but that sine wave just doesn't play well with that square wave. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm I'm I've been seeing or thinking of some older inverters where it seemed like there was one switch that did them both, but it felt like it was a one mechanical switch that was operating two different mm -hmm. um, switches themselves. So yeah, and I think so that, that, would be, that would be a redesign of the system as the inverter, the the battery enclosure as a whole. Yeah, and that kind of leads into the previous question. Well, why don't you have something on the battery that you could hit and it would turn it off? So mm -hmm. it, it doesn't seem like that far fetched of an idea. Mm -hmm. It just may not be a single, you know, blade disconnect, but maybe one single button or two, depending on what you want to do. Yeah, I don't know. I, I wrote it down. Like yeah. that's that's a beauty. I get to, you know, the the engineers here at at Tygo. I tell you, man, I, I like working for them because the German engineers I'm used to working with are very, like, <laughs> I'd love them to death, a little hard headed. But these Tygo engineers, they're a lot more open to suggestions. So, yeah, I'll, I'll flip that by them. Yeah. And then actually, what the code says, it's like um, a disconnect or it's remote control um, can be on the outside of the house. So it does open the door for a lot of different innovations and options to. to perform that functionality you need. And basically it goes back to the first responders. They wanna be able, if they're coming to your house and they need to shut down power, all circuits, all power to all circuits in the home, they need to be able to do that outside um, and not go, have to go inside the structure to go start shutting stuff down. So that's where it's coming from. Um, thankfully the code realizes, you know, well, the code made that rule, um, but they also are opening those possibilities for different options to achieve the goal. The other question that's coming up also go back, goes back to code, and I have a feeling uh, Greg's not going to like this one, um, but is Tygo working on a, a UL1741 listed power control system, which goes to that 705.13 rule about power control systems and listings um, and the ability to limit export? Yeah, that's, and, and when I first read that, I, I wasn't thinking of like the ESS off grid, I was thinking of like somewhere like Puerto Rico or Hawaii where they're not allowed to, you know, export into the grid. And I'm pretty sure our meter uh, allows for that. Jing, I'll have to, to lean on you to see if that uh, function is available. Yeah, the, the function is available for the inverter because okay. once you have the, you know, we, the system comes with a two meter. One is a production meter, which is integrated RGM inside the inverters. The second one we actually also offer, we said the energy meter, so which measures the net energy production. So with that input, the we can control the energy, uh, total energy uh, export to the grid. Uh, we have a zero net zero export functions for the inverter can uh, control the uh, production of the PV system. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question, Russell. I'm just not sure which application you were uh, referring to, but yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and I guess I'll give you another little view to the crystal ball. That power control system stuff is, is going to be in 2023, it's going to be really more under energy management. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be dictated by 750. Uh, although there's some microgrid stuff that'll stay in 705. So that's, that's an area of much development when it comes to code, I have to tell you. And so stay tuned. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, Russell's saying out in Massachusetts, man, they're always the first ones to jump on the very first code cycle. Yeah, they're all over it out there. Yeah, I read you loud and clear, Russell. I do. Yeah. So there's another question. Oh, Tor, Alan, I remember, it's Tor, I go way back with Tor, uh, many years in the industry. 
And he says he's getting here late. Well, don't worry now, now. Um, <laughs> and he, say, uh, he says, uh, this question has already been wondering, has anyone discussed situations yet where the setup is providing grid services in a virtual power plant model? Yeah, Tori, good to see you. I, I know we're connected on LinkedIn. You show up on my feed a lot. So thanks for coming in. Uh, right now, we're just focusing on residential uh, applications. There may be virtual power plant stuff in the future. You know, VPP, as you know, the, the company I previously uh, left was heavy into that area with VPPs. So um, I don't know, Jing, if you could provide any insight that I may not have. No, I mean, short term, we don't have a plan for VPP, but we understand the market is towards that, the aggregated distributed power, and the VPP is, you know, pretty important in the future, especially for people looking at the additional revenue streams. Um, yeah, I hear you loud and clear. So definitely, we, we're putting out our roadmaps. Yeah. It was inter I think it was just today, Calso sent something out about, um, there's something like three uh three quarters of a gigawatt i believe of energy storage systems in california uh alone that just they're just kind of saying hey we could utilize we could be tapping into these energy storage systems if there was a you know a funding mechanism uh, some support there um that helped the utilities offset what they need to offset um but right now just we just don't have the kind of the infrastructure in play to to make that happen but it's you know we're starting to get a lot of battery systems out there especially in california yeah yeah definitely yeah, yeah. And it, it, it provides a great resource, right? Instead of having to turn on some dirty peaker plant, yeah. you could just yank off of these energy storage systems. But it's, it's a really complicated process, right? You have to have, again, it all comes down to communication, right? And I'm not talking about like, like us to the utility. I'm talking about the actual protocol between the equipment and the protocol the uh, utility wants to use to control all that demand management. Like it, it's a huge effort not impossible we see places like germany that are already doing that um but i mean you know they're the size of texas and we're like you know that big so it's a challenge but um it'll probably start in california like these things usually do and then head out well great i really appreciate it uh jing and greg this has been great it's been a, a good conversation i'm glad to to see the you know, the Tygo solutions and um, was really happy to hear, you know, learn more about that. So um, really appreciate you joining us today, uh, everybody out there. And, you know, just want to let you all know that, you know, Mayfield, we do provide education, design and development uh, and content development sort uh, services. So happy to have you come check us out at mayfield.energy. Uh, there's, you know, mine and Justine's information's there. Justine does uh, code classes as well, um, you know, specifically around the ESS. So um, some good stuff that we can work with you all on. Um, Jing and Greg, your information's there too. So hopefully um, if people have specific questions, you can reach out. Um, yeah, thanks thanks for everybody. And we'll get the recording out to you all um, uh, as part of, part of our follow-up. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, this has been so cool. I always like talking to you guys. Good to see you. Great. Likewise, Greg. And thanks. Jing. Bye. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. I'll take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.